Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, and welcome to the U.S. Geological Survey. I'm Helen Gibbons from the Pacific Coastal and Marine Science Center, and I'm glad to see you all here for the May Public Lecture. As a quick reminder, I want to let you know that the June lecture will be on June 22nd, and it is on climate change and ocean acidification. You can pick up a flyer in the back, at the back table there. Tonight's lecture is titled, Underwater Secrets of the Hayward Fault Zone, Integrated 3D Imaging to Understand Earthquake Hazards, presented by Janet Watt. Janet received her MS in marine science with an emphasis on geological oceanography from Moss Landing Marine Laboratories in 2004. While she was earning her MS, she worked at the US Geological Survey here in Menlo Park. She was part of the geophysical unit of Menlo Park, also known as GUMP. <laughs> it's a great name. Working with that group, she combined 3D geological mapping with potential field methods, that is measurements of gravity and magnetism, to understand earthquake and volcano hazards in the western US. She also applied these methods to mineral and water resources. In 2010, Janet returned to her marine geology roots and joined the Pacific Coastal and Marine Science Center in Santa Cruz, where she currently works as a research geophysicist. Janet's research focuses on connecting onshore and offshore geologic structures, deformation, and active tectonics to address problems focused on geologic hazards and processes. Her recent work involves integrating various geophysical techniques to characterize faults and fault interactions in three dimensions. This provides a good way to detect recent fault movements and assess earthquake hazards. The USGS is pleased to bring you this program on using underwater imaging to study urban faults. As always, please hold any questions until the end of the lecture. And now, please welcome Janet Watt. Thank you, Helen. <laughs> Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to be here tonight, and thank you all for coming out to hear me talk about um, my work in, in San Pablo Bay. Tonight I'm going to tell you about uh, using a suite of geophysical tools um, to image uh, the Hayward Fault beneath San Pablo Bay and better understand the earthquake hazard of this fault zone. Now, often when I'm giving talks to folks, I talk about studying a particular fault to understand the earthquake hazards. But I want to start by explaining what does that actually mean? How do we take a site-specific fault study and understand earthquake hazards? And then what does that mean for you, the residents um, in the local area? So here on this slide, I have four products that the USGS puts out related to earthquake hazards. And so when we go out and we look for active faults, um, we try to get this information integrated into the USGS Quaternary Fault Database, which is the map on the left. Um, and this map identifies faults that cut young deposits that are active faults. And these are considered the most likely to cause earthquakes. And so this fault map on the left is used as the basis for all the following hazard maps on the right. Um, the next map in line shows the probability of a major earthquake on Bay Area faults within the next 30 years. Um, and these probabilities take into consideration decades of earthquake research on the size and frequency of past events on the Bay Area faults. Now, given the estimated earthquake size and frequency, plus knowledge about local geology and soil conditions, seismologists can estimate the amount of shaking um, that is likely to occur in any given area. And that's portrayed on the U.S. National Seismic Hazard Maps on the next one. And this information is used in designing building codes and insurance rates used in the United States. Now the map on the far right shows a shake map, a scenario uh, of a scenario earthquake, magnitude seven on the Hayward Fault. And a shake map shows the shaking intensity expected in the, in the area and the higher, highest shaking is shown in the red colors. And these maps are used in planning and coordinating emergency response in, in local areas. 
So here's a roadmap of what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. First, I'll explain the motivation of the work we're doing in San Pablo and explain what the scientific questions are we're trying to answer. Now I'll explain how we use sound to image faults in the marine environment, how we connect surface faults to depths where earthquakes occur in 3D geologic mapping, and how we use acoustic trenching to unravel the history of earthquakes along the fault. So all this is based on the idea that understanding past earthquakes will help us prepare for future ones. So as a researcher, I have an affinity, and some might say an obsession, for fault discontinuities. And those are fault intersections, stepovers, bends, um, little kinks in faults. One of the reasons I find these areas so fascinating is that because they likely hold the key to understanding why some earthquakes cascade into multi-fault devastating events and others do not. And I'll explain what I mean. So until recently, the prevailing theory was that earthquakes are confined to fault segments. Um, and here I portray that the gray line is a fault line and the, the red part is an earthquake rupture. It's defined and its endpoints are defined by what we call segment boundaries in the blue boxes. Um, however, recent large events have shown us that sometimes earthquakes are not confined to single fault segments. And on the far right, I show an example of a rupture that breaks through multiple segment boundaries and becomes a very large earthquake. And a recent example of this is the Kaikoura earthquake in New Zealand that broke as many as 10 surface faults in one event and likely the megathrust subduction fault also. So a lot of large events are showing us that while sometimes earthquakes only break single segments on a fault, we know that they can and do break um, through those segment boundaries. And this has highlighted the need to take a closer look at these segment boundaries and reassess their role in earthquake hazard assessment. So these fault discontinuities, places where faults bend and, and there are kinks in these faults, are inherently unstable. The fault wants to be straight, so it's constantly sort of reorganizing itself to try to straighten itself out. And what, what this means is often at the surface, you have a very complex network of faults at the surface, like as I portrayed here on the left. And what we need to do to understand the hazard in an area is understand which of these faults are currently active and how they connect to one another and link up. And then once we figure out which of the faults at the surface are active, we need to understand how those faults connect um, down to where earthquakes occur, which is much deeper in the earth. And so here on the left, I've shown a cross section, basically, of the surface trace at the top and trying to connect down to where these earthquakes occur. And so we need to know what the dip is, down dip geometry or shape of the fault from the surface down to where the earthquakes are occurring. <laughs> And then we need to know how often these earthquakes rupture this fault. So here, this is a screen grab from the USGS Quaternary Fault Database that you can get to online. Um, and it shows the map faults in the Bay Area and their ages. Um, and here is the Hayward Rogers Creek Fault highlighted in red. Note that there are no faults mapped in San Pablo Bay between the Hayward and Rogers Creek Fault currently on this map. This has always bothered me ever since I came to the survey. I wondered, why Why can't we find this fault? Is it just that it's underwater? I mean, we've got to be able to figure this out. So um, it was an honor to get to try to go out and figure this out. So why is it important to understand the geometry beneath San Pablo Bay? Well, this is, area has been defined as a segment boundary in, in a number of earthquake models in California. Um, but we, yet, we don't understand exactly where the active fault goes. And also, the Hayward Rogers Creek Fault cuts through the heart of the San Francisco Bay Area, which boasts the fourth largest economy in the US and ranks among the top 20 in the world. So there's a lot at stake along this fault zone. The most recent large earthquake on the Hayward Fault was in 1868, and that's about 150 years ago. The five earthquakes before that one occurred approximately at 140 year intervals. And that's why the Hayward and Rogers Creek faults are considered the most likely Bay Area fault to experience a major earthquake within the next 30 years. So how big an earthquake could that be if these faults are ready to go? That depends on the fault length. Um, 
And according to recent mapping, the Hayward and Rogers Creek faults together are 190 kilometers long. And they extend from north of Healdsburg in the north to Alum Rock in the south. And based on that length, it can create up to a magnitude 4, a 7.4 earthquake. So here we've zoomed in a bit on that quaternary fault map on the left um, into where you can see San Pablo Bay. And the ability of an earthquake on the Hayward Fault to continue onto the Rogers Creek Fault, or vice versa, depends on the geometrical relationship between these faults beneath San Pablo Bay. And until now, that relationship has remained uncertain. So here are the, are the goals of, of the project. Um, definitively locate and characterize the most recent active Hayward Rogers Creek Fault in 3D beneath San Pablo Bay. And that involves what I call integrated geophysical approach. The second part is to constrain the earthquake history along this portion of the fault. And that involves geological sampling and coring beneath the bay. So here we are looking at San Pablo Bay. We have the Hayward Fault going offshore in the south at Pinole Point. And up to the north, we have the Rogers Creek Fault coming down and going offshore near Sears Point by the raceway up there to the north. So where the faults enter the bay, they're separated by about five kilometers. Now, San Pablo Bay is very shallow. I don't know if many of you know this, but most of the bay is less than five meters deep, except for the shipping channel in the south, which is that dark blue color, is about 12 meters deep, and that's where the big barges go through. Um, and this shallow water is one of the reasons it makes it very difficult to get ships in there to collect data and image the fault. Um, and this is likely part of the reason why the relationship between these faults has remained a mystery for so long. The other reason is that there is widespread gas in the bay sediments from decaying organic matter. It's a natural process. There's shallow gas in many estuaries across the U.S. Um, but this shallow gas um, scatters the acoustic signal and makes imaging the geologic structure in this area very difficult. But we chose to target the very shallow layers above that gas layer to look for, for signs of activity. So the geometry and connectivity of these fault zones um, has been discussed and debated for years with workers describing the relationship between the two faults as either what's called a step over or as a fault bend. Um, and resolving this uncertainty is particularly important because these alternative fault models have different implications for earthquake dynamics and local ground motion. And you can imagine if two faults are separated by a distance, it's, it's, it's difficult, more difficult for an earthquake to jump from one to the other. It's possible, and we know it's possible. Um, however, but if there's a fault bend and there's a direct connection, it's like the faults are holding hands, and it's easier for an earthquake to travel from one to the other. So the problem is this previous work, none of these interpretations were based or supported by direct evidence of near-surface active faulting. So phase one is our integrated geophysical approach to try to solve this problem. We want to document the active faulting in San Pablo Bay. And to do this, we used an ultra-high resolution chirp seismic reflection. I'll explain that in more detail in a minute. Um, but again, we're focusing, we're trying to image small deformation or small uh, centimeter scale offsets in the very near surface. And then we want to link that surface structure to depths where earthquakes occur, figure out its 3D shape. And to do that, we integrate our near surface observations with marine magnetics, as well as existing geologic and geophysical information, as well as deformation modeling. So I talk, I'm using subsurface imaging techniques, seismic reflection, and this is done on land um, as well. Um, but on land, imaging with seismic reflection can be very tricky. And as an example, this is the East Bay seismic investigation that is, was carried out by the USGS recently. Um, and they wanted to image the structure of the Hayward Fault and the Chabot Fault here. And this is one seismic line, and it took an amazing amount of work to collect um, seismic data along this one transect. And they had to drill holes. Um, it was an amazing amount of manpower to just get one cross-section. We have, um, we're lucky in the marine environment because here's a map of all the cross-sections that we get throughout San Pablo Bay from towing our seismic source behind our vessel. That we get 13 fault cross-sections spaced about a kilometer apart. 
shown by the yellow lines. Um, and when we have this sort of spatial um, grouping of cross sections, we can characterize changes in the faults along strike. And we can image at higher resolutions than you can on land. Up to again, we can measure centimeter offsets. Um, and the active marine sedimentation within the bay is a natural tape recorder of past events. So you can't record um, earthquake events unless you have an active sedimentary record to look at, and we have that in the marine environment. So here's a, a primer on seismic reflection, um, just to explain how it works. So basically, you have a survey vessel, and we tow what's called an acoustic source. Uh, and basically, we send acoustic waves, and they propagate through the water column and into the subsurface. They're reflected from layers that show a contrast in what's called acoustic impedance. Basically, changes in physical properties, a sand layer, a clay layer, reflect sound differently. Those reflected signals are recorded by hydrophones on the receiver, and then data is processed to produce 2D cross-sections, kind of like a road cut of the subsurface, the sediment layers below the seafloor. So I mentioned that what we use is called a CHIRP, and that stands for Compressed High Intensity Radar Pulse. And this uses very high frequencies. The difference between this um, instrument and the image I showed before is that here the source and the receiver are on the same unit. Um, and this is ideal for imaging shallow structures, uh, faults. We can Im image centimeter scale vertical offsets, and it's capable of these, um, the system is capable of imaging tens of meters below the seafloor in ideal conditions. But I mentioned San Pablo Bay is not an ideal condition because of the shallow gas in the area. Um, but luckily, the two to five meters below the subsea floor above the gas was quite revealing in terms of showing us what the Hayward Fault is doing. So we got lucky. Because the, the, the bay is very shallow, we towed our instrument at the surface. We had to put it on these pontoons to keep it from sinking and dragging in the mud. So uh, this, this method worked very well to keep the, the, the fish at the surface. Normally, we tow the fish down behind the boat. It, it sinks below the sea surface a few meters. But in San Pablo, San Pablo Bay, that wouldn't work. It would drag in the mud. So here is an image. It's called a seismic profile, basically a road cut showing the sediments below the seafloor. Um, and this is a, a, an image from the northern part of the bay, the yellow line on the map on the upper right. You can see that very strong black-red black line is the seafloor reflector. So that's the seafloor at the very top there. Um, you can see the layers, there's layers, flat lying layers below that, but then as you get further down in the section, those layers start to be deformed or warped. And uh, down the middle of this cross section, the layers actually, they're, it's like they're cut. They don't match on either side, they're offset. You can't, and that's the Hayward Fault that we're imaging right there. And the, at the bottom, where the signal goes from seeing layers to sort of fuzzy, that's the gas. So how do we map this fault across the bay using these data? We basically look at all these cross sections that are shown on the right, and we identify the fault. Where's, where's the sediment section broken? And we put a mark on the map, and then we essentially connect the dots. And so we see here, as the fault traverses the bay um, from the south to the north, it's bending slightly about 10 degrees to the right towards the Rogers Creek Fault. So with these CHIRP data, we have the first direct evidence of active faulting along the Hayward Fault in San Pablo Bay. Now, what happens in this area is the next question. So here we see the southern part of the Rogers Creek Fault um, at Sears Point. And previously, it was, uh, so the southern Rogers Creek Fault branches into two faults. The eastern strand follows the main trend further to the north, and the western strand diverges by about 22 degrees. So the western strand of the Rogers Creek Fault points directly towards our offshore fault that we've mapped. Um, along, and it extends along, there's distinct linear gradients in the topography along the side of Sears Point there. 
that it follows. Previously, it was thought that the Rogers Creek Fault continued along its main eastern trend into San Pablo Bay. However, our seismic data show no definitive evidence for offset in the near surface along this projected trace. And in the next slide, I'll show you a couple profiles of this lack of offset on that trace. So here we have two seismic profiles crossing the bay. Lines A and B are shown in the map in the upper right. And the projected trace of the Rogers Creek Fault cuts through here. You'll see this, the layers beneath the seafloor are not obviously cut where that, that fault projects offshore. And that leads us to believe that either that fault um, was never there, or it's presently not active. So the integrated onshore-offshore evidence described above strongly suggests the Hayward and Rogers Creek faults are directly connected, as I portrayed here in the red dashed line. And what the, the other faint lines you see behind there are previous interpretations of the step over, which is shown in the white dashed line, and the fault bend by the black dashed line. It's not that much different, but it our new result shows that they are directly connected. So since our onshore evidence for faulting is not as strong as the offshore evidence, we wanted to see if our provo proposed connection um, made physical sense. And so to do this, I enlisted the help of a colleague named Tom Parsons to help me with what's called deformation modeling. You basically take um, the fault, or, or interpreted fault here, um, and then model what happens when you slip two blocks past each other with that, with that geometry. And that model shows areas where, that are deformed where the land goes up and where the land goes down in this model. And so we want to compare the model deformation to what we observe and see if they're the same, see if it makes physical sense. So what we see here are the results, the zone of greatest subsidence, which is shown in the blue, um, is consistent with the diffuse seismicity in an area of active extensional deformation. Seismicity is shown by those black dots you see on the map. And also, there's a subtle elongate depression, or SAG, observed in the seismic data offshore in the area of predicted greatest subsidence where the land goes down. So in the next slide, I'm going to show you a couple profiles that cross this area of subsidence, or the SAG. So here I have two profiles at the northern end of the bay, and you can see the sediments are flat lying at the top, but as you go down in the sections, they bow towards each other and, and look like a basin, basically. Um, and this basin um, is elongated along the Hayward Fault Zone. We do not see this depression in the southern half of the bay. It's just isolated in this one corner of the bay where the model predicted that we'd have the greatest subsidence. We believe this depression is indicative of the formation of what's called the Lazy Z Fault Bend Basin. These are, um, are observed all over the world where um, strike-slip faults make a right bend. They, often there is extension of basin forms. There's substance and the land goes down in that bend. So this basin has likely been trapping sediment here and is likely a good area, uh, has potential for preserving an earthquake record. It might be a good place to go coring. And so that's what we did eventually. So the onshore offshore evidence combined with our deformation modeling shows that the Hayward and Rogers Creek faults are directly connected through a fault bend. And this direct connection makes it easier for an earthquake to rupture from the Hayward to the Rogers Creek or vice versa. So now that we know where the active trace is, we want to understand how that trace extends into the subsurface to where earthquakes occur. So to do this, there are a number of different geophysical tools that we can and did use in San Pablo Bay. Um, and I've listed them here on the right. However, in the interest of time, I'm just going to talk about two um, that I'm most familiar with, um, and that's gravity and magnetics. It's important to note that the interpretation of all these data types involve assumptions and uncertainties. They're not direct observations. Um, hence, the need for an integrated approach. 
if you use different, a number of different techniques and we get the same answer, we have more confidence in our results. So how do we use gravity and magnetics to map faults? Well, we take advantage of the fact that faults often juxtapose rock units with different physical properties, different types of rocks, especially on strike-slip faults where faults move laterally um, from one another. So you have a dense object here, and a fault moves, and it offsets that from the other. And then you end up getting a contrast across the fault and the physical properties, and that shows up in a gravity or magnetic anomaly. So we can map edges of magnetic or dense rock units using the horizontal gradient maxima of that anomaly, so the slope. If those boundaries correspond to fault traces, then we can use those anomalies to estimate fault dip. So here is an aeromagnetic um, anomaly map of San Pablo Bay. And this was the magnetic data that existed before we went out and collected new marine magnetic data. And the previous interpretation of the fault was that the Hayward Fault just extended straight across the bay, sort of coincident with this magnetic anomaly. So here, these anomalies reflect the amount of magnetite, in a sense, within the crustal rocks. And warm colors are magnetic highs, and cool colors are dipole or magnetic lows. So this is what existed before we collected data sort of a fuzzy view of things. But a colleague of mine, Dave Potts, went out and collected marine magnetic data along this dense grid of, of track lines spaced about 200 meters apart, and that's the resulting image. Much more detail, and you can see that the previous interpretation doesn't quite work anymore. And this is the, the trace of the Hayward Fault that we mapped with the CHIRP data. And it aligns very nicely, and um, follows the northeast boundary of two prominent magnetic anomalies here, A and B, um, the sources of which are likely serpentinite, coast range ophiolite, um, or tertiary volcanic rocks, all with a high degree of magnetite in them. But what you, I also want to draw your attention to here are these subtle, what we call short wavelength anomalies and gradients along the, the fault trace. And these likely reflect folding and or vertical offset of tertiary volcanic rocks within the fault zone itself. And we can only identify these very small features with these new data, very high resolution, close spacing, new magnetic data. So here is an isostatic gravity map of St. Pablo Bay. And isostatic gravity anomalies reflect the lateral density variations in the upper crust. And so the strong gradient you see here in the bay, the change in color, uh, reflects the juxtaposition of dense Franciscan basement rocks on the left in the warm colors with lower density tertiary sedimentary rocks on the right in the blue colors. And the maximum horizontal gradient, shown by the white dashed line, corresponds to the fault mapped with our seismic and marine magnetic data, shown in the, the black X's. So now we have a correspondence between our surface trace and this maximum horizontal gradient in the gravity data. So we can now make an estimate of fault dip. So if a fault juxtaposes rocks of different densities and the surface trace is known, which it is, one can determine the dip of the fault at depth from the position of the maximum horizontal gradient relative to the slope of that anomaly. And so here I've shown that if that surface trace is sort of in the middle of that slope, then it indicates that that's likely a vertical boundary. And if it's at either the top or the bottom of that curve, the fault is dipping. And so in San Pablo Bay, the shape of the gradient is shown over on the right, and it's sort of a hybrid between a vertical and a northeast dipping fault. So the shape of the gradient here suggests a vertical to steeply northeast dipping fault. OK, so we're done with phase one. We've identified the fault of the surface and estimated its dip from the gravity data. Now on to phase two, which is in progress. We haven't completed this phase yet. Um, but it involves geological sampling and coring in San Pablo Bay. <laughs> So the path an earthquake rupture takes depends not only on the fault geometry and connectivity, but on other factors, including the earthquake history 
So there's a large body of existing work on earthquake history along this fault system. And it all indicates that the Hayward and Rogers Creek faults have each accumulated enough stress to produce a major earthquake. Now, now that we know these two faults are essentially holding hands, we need to ask if or how often they have ruptured together in the past. And so estimates of the timing of the most recent events along the Rogers Creek Fault, shown in the purple star, furthest to the north, and prehistoric events on the northern and southern Hayward Fault, um, allow the possibility of a combined rupture in the mid-1700s. Now, there are a number of uncertainties associated with the dates of these past events on any one location along the fault. Um, but the uncertainties in, on these three events overlap, so it allows the possibility that they all ruptured at one time, or they ruptured within decades of each other. We can't quite tell because of the uncertainties. So the more observations we have of fault history along a fault zone, the more confidence we build in sort of what events um, are the same. So perhaps San Pablo Bay has a record of past earthquakes that could help. So much of the previous work on fault history on land involved the use of paleoseismology, or the study of ancient earthquakes. And this is based on the concept, first you, you, you know where your active fault trace is, and you dig a trench across it, which is shown in the picture on the right, and this is actually a, a fault trench across a fault in Lake Tahoe. But the concept is, before an earthquake, you have a flat-lying surface. An earthquake occurs, you create a scarp for movement on the fault, vertical movement on the fault. And then that scarp erodes and deposits what's called a colluvial wedge, a pile of sediment from the erosion of that scarp. And then the, over time, sediment fills in that different elevation, and you get a flat line layer over the top, and the sequence repeats itself. And what we try to do, um, what's done in paleoseismology, is you date the pre- and post-earthquake sedimentary deposits exposed in the trench walls. But of course, you can't just trench anywhere. Um, you need to target areas with active sedimentation that can record a history of fault movement. So you have to pick sites where sediment is actively accumulating to record events. We use the same technique um, in the marine environment, but we do it a little bit differently. Um, so the northern end of San Pablo Bay, where we modeled the subsidence and our chirp data show that we have a basin where you'd have active sedimentation. This is an area that's likely to record past events. Um, so what we look for in our chirp data is what's called evidence of growth faulting. And here on the right, I have an animation to show what I mean by growth faulting or event, event stratigraphy. So you have a fault shown in the red dashed line and sediment layers are those black lines. An earthquake occurs. You have a scarp forming. Sediment fills in the area, or accommodation space, we call it. Um, and then new sediment is deposited on top in between earthquakes. Then there's another event. Sediment fills in that depression. Flatline sediments are laid on top. So what we do, we can identify those sedimentary sequences in the seismic data, and then we can go core those sequences and try to get dates above and below these event horizons. So that's what we did um, in the fall of 2016. That's a typo. So just this past fall, um, on a four-day coring cruise um, on a barge called the Retriever in San Pablo Bay. So here in the left is a picture of that bar, the back of the barge and what's called the A-frame, that black A-shaped frame. And then our coring device is on the back of the boat lying down there. Um, and this A-frame uh, lifts and guides our about four meter long core to the seafloor where it's pushed into the bay mud um, with a vibrating head that sits on top of that core barrel there. It basically sits there and vibrates into the ground until it doesn't go any further. And then we pull it back out, pull it onto the deck, retrieve the core, cut it up, and take it back to the lab. Oh, I forgot. The map on the right shows all the locations that we cored in the blue circles. 
And so to understand the earthquake history of the fault zone, we collected pairs of cores on either side of the fault, particularly in the northern part of the bay where there's most, the most evidence for subsidence. And we take the cores from the barge back to the lab and run analyses. The first thing we do is run the cores through what's called a multi-sensor core logger. And we measure things like P wave velocity, magnetic susceptibility, electro resistivity, gamma density, and we photograph the core, basically measuring its physical properties with a bunch of different methods. Then we split the core in half, take half the core, keep it as an archive, use the other half for sampling. We do a detailed description of the core, um, uh, describe its sedimentology, color, um, grain size. And then we identify areas to subsample, get dates. So what we're trying to figure out is when did this fault last move? Here's the seismic se section from the northern part of the bay, the area that has evidence for subsidence or where the land is going down. We have two cores that we drilled there, marked 11 and 12, on either side of the Hayward Fault, which cuts the center of that, of that profile. You can see the layers at the top of that profile are, are horizontal. They're not broken. But then where that red star is on the left, below that, those layers are broken. And so... In order to understand when the fault last moved, we need to date the sediments above that star and below that star. So we can bracket in the age of that movement. And we use a combination of dating methods, just like um, we use a combination of geophysical techniques because they all have uncertainties. We want to use many different techniques to do the dating so we're confident in our results. And right now, we're waiting for those dates to come back from the lab. <laughs> so stay tuned maybe come back next year and I'll have more to say about the earthquake history of these faults <laughs> it's a time consuming job but we'll get there so in summary phase one we integrated onshore and offshore analysis to show that the most recent trace of the Hayward fault connects to the Rogers Creek fault through a fault bend and the gravity data suggests the fall is vertical to steeply northeast dipping. We've collected and began analyzing cores from the bay to understand how the fault zone has evolved through time and when the last earthquake ruptured this part of the fault. So what does this mean for earthquake hazard? Well, the discovery of a direct link enables simultaneous rupture of the Hayward and Rogers Creek faults. And that's a scenario that could result in a magnitude 7.4 earthquake, which would cause extensive, extensive damage with global economic impact. And for a more local perspective, I don't know how many of you in the room remember the Loma Prieta earthquake, but a magnitude 7.4 would release five times the energy as the Loma Prieta earthquake, which caused 63 deaths and six to 10 billion in property loss. The other thing to remember about the Loma Prieta earthquake was that it was not in the Bay Area. It was in the Santa Cruz Mountains, quite a distance from here. And the Hayward and Rogers Creek Fault, many other faults run through the Bay Area. To provide a, some more um, context, this is a slide that shows a comparison of insured and economic losses from recent natural disasters, past quakes and hurricanes, and earthquake scenarios on the right. And I want to draw your attention to magnitude 7, um, Hayward scenario and its total economic loss compared to Hurricane Katrina. M more significant loss than Hurricane Katrina. But what's really, what's really disturbing is the insured loss for Hurricane Katrina. About half of that loss was insured, but no one has earthquake insurance, or very few people have earthquake insurance. And so that fact means it'll be more difficult to recover from an earthquake. So you all might be wondering, what would shaking from a strong earthquake on the Hayward Rogers Creek fault look like? Well, here's estimated shaking intensity from a magnitude 7.2 scenario on the Hayward and Rogers Creek earthquake with an epicenter where the earthquake began in San Pablo Bay. 
And the red colors are show the strongest shaking. And you can see the strong shaking is distributed throughout the entire Bay Area. But it's focused in shallow basins between cities like Santa Rosa, Livermore, Fremont, and San Jose. Because the basin sediments actually amplify ground motion. So it's interesting to need to note that this scenario was based on what was then considered to be an unlinked um, step over between the Hayward and Rogers Creek. And given the documented sensitivity of, of ground motions to the shape of faults, um, ground motions in a link scenario may be somewhat different than what's pictured here. The good news in all this is that cities like San Francisco are in fact taking steps to prepare um, for big earthquakes by um, passing landmark earthquake retrofit laws. And in terms of hazard planning, thanks to the foresight of folks that work at the USGS and other geological agencies, they've prepared for a linked um, Hayward Rogers Creek fault event, um, even though we didn't have direct evidence that the two faults connected. So that's good. The Working Group on California Earthquake Probabilities first included a combined Hayward Rogers Creek scenario in 1999. And shaking estimates from such a scenario are part of the current national seismic hazard map upon which building codes are, are made. So they've planned for the shaking for an event of this size, even though there wasn't direct evidence that the faults were connected. And the Uniform California Earthquake Rupture Forecast, USERF 3, I'm not sure if you've heard of that considers the two faults as separate segments capable of rupturing together, which is good. The new detailed information on the connectivity of the Hayward and Rogers Creek faults will be incorporated into future scientific studies that model the behavior and ground shaking of combined Hayward Rogers Creek events. And those results can be incorporated into the next generation of USGS hazard products and perhaps go into improving some of the hazard models that we use today. So, in closing, I want to remind you all that I, I like to tell people that there's no sense worrying about things we can't control, earthquakes, but we can prepare for those things. So we all need to be prepared for the next big earthquake. And even fault-obsessed geoscientists need to be reminded to prepare and take care of the earthquake kit, replace your water, make sure your family plan is in order. And I just wanted to remind you that there's a lot of information for what you can do to be prepared online on websites. Here I've taken a screen grab from the Association of Bay Area Governments. The USGS has information on their websites that's easily available. If you want to go, how do I make an earthquake kit? How do I, need, how do I know if I need to retrofit parts of my home? How do I make a family emergency plan? So there are things you can do to prepare. And thank you for coming. Thank you, Janet. That was a great talk. Um, we'll now take questions from the audience, and I'd like you to use the microphones that are in the aisles there uh, for the benefit of our online listeners, or if you'd like, I can bring you this microphone. Thanks. It does work. Uh, you showed a slide, a few slides back, uh, in, with vertical bars of the insured losses for. What, what, what counties was that twenty-four billion for? That's a good question. I'm not sure. Oh, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the, the twenty-nine point four billion. Uh, I'm not sure the answer to that question. Oh, okay. It's a good question. Because I've, I've considered the earthquake insurance possibilities, but mm -hmm. uh, apparently they're only underwritten, underwritten to about 11 or 12 billion. Mm -hmm. And no one explains where the extra money comes from. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm like, just stating the facts. I don't, yeah. <laughs> Next question would be a question of the fact that you said that the energy of a fault or the magnitude depends on the length of a fault. But that, does that also mean, though, that since the longer fault has greater energy, it's also spread out over a greater area, so the energy per unit area may not be that much worse if it has a larger magnitude? Well, it depends how close you are to the epicenter. The striking is, it would be 
in a larger earthquake, in a larger earthquake, that energy would be split over a larger area. But the closer you are to the epicenter, the stronger that energy would be. Thank you. Yeah, I'm wondering about the banding that occurred in the um, on the um, sediments. So uh, I'm assuming that's a high or a small particle, large large particle. You know, sand versus mud. And would that be due to different flooding that would come uh, from transport out of the Sierras through the, through the delta? It could. It could be from many different things. Okay, so um, could you name a couple other things that it could be? Um, well, you can get different um, thicknesses of sediment would, co would create a different acoustic signal, if the thick versus thin, mm -hmm. different sediment sizes, grain sizes. Um, yeah, you can get big sand impulses seasonally. Um, you can get shifts in uh, hydraulic mining occurred in the, in the bay during a certain period and there was a lot of sedimentation associated with that. And we see a marker in, in the bay, in the cores, where we see basically a change from where you'd have that high cementation to deeper in the core where you see mostly sand layers and less mud. So it can be environmental changes that occur and that, that cause sort of discontinuities in the sedimentary layers. Like Thanks. Mm -hmm. I have a general question that goes beyond what you talked about, and that is when one looks at the Hayward Fault and the San Andreas system, they're parallel. They don't seem too far apart. Do they interact? If one moves, does it relieve stress on the other? If one moves, can it trigger the other? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Yes, all these fault zones interact on some level. The answer to your question depends how close they are and where they are relative to one another. But you're right. In an event on the San Andreas Fault, it imparts stress on certain parts of other faults. And it releases stress on certain parts of other faults. And yes, that, that has an effect on this all, overall stress budget. Um, and there is evidence that earthquakes on one fault do in fact dynamically trigger earthquakes on, on other nearby faults. That's not my expertise, but that is known to happen. Yeah. Great talk, thanks. Uh, one of your early maps had the shake profile, but the, the color of the bay area was blue. I mean, does that mean that the bay doesn't shake? I mean. Maybe I'll, I'll try to find that map. I don't, I'm trying to. Was it in the was Wait, it like the second slide? Yeah. Okay. Here? Yeah, over on the over on the right there's there's the It should come back up. Okay. Oh, that's because the underwater areas have just been blued out. <laughs> They, yeah, they need to have a better appreciation for the underwater areas. Not it, in reality, that red should extend across the bay. Yeah, I think that on the last, second to last slide, that water body blue color was removed, and you could actually see the extent of the shaking. So, that's a good observation. <laughs> when, when, you, when you're looking for data at a place like that, how, how accurately can you measure the location of, of small faults? I mean, could you just surround the place with a whole bunch of seismometers and wait a couple of years and look at all the data from the little ones? Well, how we found a find active faults is not usually with earthquake seismometers. It's with actually geology going on the ground and looking at morphology, scarps that form on the surface. And then we actually dig into the earth and look at what happens below the surface. Yeah. Sometimes active Active faults that we see on the surface are associated with seismicity or earthquakes at depth, but sometimes they're not. So, on the shaking, on the shaking map that you did show us, uh, it, where was the epicenter? In San Pablo Bay. Oh, in the bay. In the bay, because it's a segment boundary, and segment boundaries are thought to be places where stress builds up, and earthquakes can begin or end. Thank you. Um, so on your cores, uh, so at some point the um, 
the bay was dry. It was about 10,000 years ago during the Ice Age or so. Um, so do you know if your four meter cores, was that all um, underwater sediments or were there any uh, sediments that were laid uh, while it was dry? It's a great question. Um, based on preliminary dates that we have from those sediments, they were all, they're all too young. They were underwater. So our cores don't go back that far in time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That, that's roughly what I was going to ask. What's, if, if instead of measuring in, in meters, you measure in years, how, how, how deep are those profiles you were showing? Um, well, the, the two cores that we have some preliminary dates on, which are in the northern part of the bay, our cores extend into the subsurface about three meters, and the deepest date we have is um, 14, about around 1400 AD. Okay. So when, Recent. When a seismologist says uh, recently active, what's yeah. what, what, uh, sorry, wasn't wasn't recently it was currently active? Yeah, what's what's current on your on your scale? Um, recently active in terms of earthquake hazard and, and the Quaternary Fault Database, Holocene active the last ten thousand years. Thank you. Oh, research uh, question. Is somebody asking a question? No. A research question? Uh, it seems like you've got a, a really good, dense set of data from the acoustic chirp methods. Uh, there's a, a lot of software now that's been developed in the petroleum industry for three-dimensional interpretation. I notice your, your plots are all two-dimensional. Do you have access or might you be, be able to put that into a three-dimensional imager for more detailed study? Yeah, we do have um, the ability to put it into 3D. So that could be a direction that we go in. And that's probably what I'm going to end up doing next to look at certain unconformities or distinct layers I see in the bay that I think indicate a time horizon. And I'd like to trace those through the seismic data and look at what that looks like. So that's on the list. <laughs> I thought that your first image uh, seismic section was outstanding. Um, you might want to bring that up. Uh, on the left side, the sediments are extremely deformed. The right side, they're not. Did all that deformation take place in one event, or is that just accumulation of deformation on the left side of the, the fault as imaged? It, it's your first seismic it's, section yeah, that came I'm, up. Yeah. It's, it's really outstanding. There's that all that deformations to the it, left. When did it happen? At once? We're not quite sure time? yet. I th it could have happened in one event, or it could be a cumulative um, event. Uh, the fact that the layers are all bent the same amount from the bottom through the top tells me it's probably close together in time because they're all the same shape. There's not a progression going on. Um, but we still don't know. The one thing you have to keep in mind with looking at these sections that I didn't explain is because we're looking at a very shallow section, these sections have been squeezed. And so they're highly vertically exaggerated and that can sort of mess you up, your eyes. Um, but that's a good question. That's partly what we want to do with the coring is get sort of indications of time and sort of back out how these events occurred and if there were, you know, what amount of time would happen between say that, that folding event and then the layers on top of it are relatively flat lying. And the second question is, uh, you, you talked about um, risk and insurance. Do you recommend buying earthquake insurance? <laughs> <laughs> I will make no recommendations on that topic. <laughs> and the USGS does not study risk. <laughs> I'm curious about tsunami hazard in from a uh, earth from about here from a. Uh, <laughs> You know, earthquake along San Andreas or this fault, you know, from water inside the bay hitting shores, you know, other side of the bay or whatever. Just any uh, in interest on that or any inf information on that? Well, anytime you have a fault that could accommodate vertical displacement, move the seafloor up and down in, a, in an event, could displace water and create a tsunami. But tsunamis can come in many orders of magnitude, so that you can have a 20 centimeter tsunami created from an earthquake, or you can have a 10 meter tsunami created from an earthquake. The largest tsunamis are usually created in subduction zones. 
where you have vertical displacement at deep depths further offshore can create a larger wave. Um, you can get tsunamis from offsets of strike slip faults for the vertical offsets and also the horizontal offsets they're finding um, can create can displace the seafloor and create a wave. And there was actually, there was an earthquake, the, I'm blanking on the year, it's the Mar Island earthquake. They, it happened in the 1800s and they don't know exactly what fault it happened on, but they recorded a very small tsunami in the bay from that, on the order of, um, I think a meter or less. So, mm. yes is the answer, that they can happen, yeah. Um, I, I agree that that's a wonderful picture. To my eye, there's another fault there that you didn't mention anything about. <laughs> Just to the right of the one you've labeled. Just to the right of the one labeled? Yeah, there, there, well, the tenth of the screen, uh, one meter to the right, right by the this vertical bar. This way? Yeah, no, over a little farther. Over here? A little farther to the right, that one. Oh. Are you talking about this vertical, apparently yeah. vertical? That's the tricky gas. You have to be careful. Gas can jump from layer to layer without a fault and have it appear that there is a break there when in fact it's just the gas jumping around in the section. So, and the reason I, the reason I say it, it's, I think it's the gas is because I can actually see concordant features below that that are not offset. So if you have a fault, all the features below that where you think the fault is need to be offset. Does that make sense? Okay. You, in one of your slides, you described the fault as a strike-slip fault, which I thought meant the lateral. And you also describe it as having fault dip, vertical. Which is it? How do those two work? Strike slip faults predominantly moved lat move laterally from one to the other. But they also can accommodate significant vertical motion. Both. Both. Yeah. So technically, it's an oblique slip fault. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. <laughs> You had a, a slide showing a quake in the Roger Hebrew Fault is three times as much uninsured damage as, as Katrina. And was that for a, a magnitude 7 quake or a magnitude 7.4? Magnitude 7. Magnitude 7. So it could be as much as a 7.4. And we really Would likely be worse. Yeah. Damage. Yeah. I'd like to explore worst case scenario with you. You mentioned earlier tonight, you can have an earthquake that triggers another, another quake on another fault, perhaps. Possibility have one in the Bay Area now, I think if we have one of the Hayward Fault, I have seven or more, we could fill down here on the peninsula too, this far away, it wouldn't be that big a deal. Possibility we have a, uh, uh, an earthquake that triggers no one on a number of different faults you wind up with something that's about nine or nine point six that, that you know a, 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 one reaction to another one at different faults at the same time this place i I, I get the visions this place looks like Hiroshima after we dropped the bomb on wouldn't be anything left what's well, that possibility of that it's possible yeah. that all these faults can link up. Yeah. But the likelihood of that is extremely small because I'll remind you all that large earthquake, very large earthquakes happen very, very infrequently. Yeah. Moderate earthquakes happen much more often in, in our lifetimes. Yeah. So, yeah. We you have a number of fives in your lifetime, occasional six or seven once in a while. But we had, last time we had eight, uh, the 06 quake in San Francisco. That yeah, it was a large one, and, and not very many people were living here at that no, time. No, no. Mm -hmm. I think those people all passed away by now, too. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, not yeah. sure. <laughs> all right, thanks.
Hi, so I have a, a quick question, which is actually a follow-up on this slide. And it's a two-part question. So during a potential earthquake, looking at the gaseous layer at the bottom, how much of that could potentially be released in terms of given the fact that it's, it's a slip that's sliding and not sort of an upward movement? Well, I don't really know the answer to your question. But given the fact that it's not under a lot of pressure, because it's not very deep gas, I don't think it would be released catastrophically. I don't think it would be released catastrophically. But yeah, likely some would be released in some form Yeah, during shaking. So given that's the case, how have you been able to capture all this data so that if such a disruption takes place, we still have all these beautiful pictures that you've taken that still show where the fault exists, given the gas would probably mess up this image? Well, I'm not sure what the gas would do. It might, if, it, if the gas were released, it might clear up some of the image for a short <laughs> period of time before it has a chance to reaccumulate. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a good question, but. But yeah, don't worry, we'll hold on to these in the, in the event that happens. You described the Hayward Fault's primary motion as being up and down. How does, what does the San Andreas Fault do, and is its movement consistent along the entire length of the San Andreas Fault? So if, I, if you heard me describe that the predominant movement of the Hayward Fault is up and down, then I misspoke. Um, what this technique measures, we are only capable of detecting vertical fault movement with our 2D cross sections. Okay, so I can only measure vertical fault motion because I know this is a strike slip fault that has accommodated a lot of motion through time. Um, I know that the the horizontal motion is likely much greater than the vertical motion we measure here. But what what happens along a fault zone? is that as the fault bends and changes trajectory, it's the amount of vertical motion to horizontal motion changes quite dramatically within tens of meters, hundreds of meters you can get in one area on a, on a fault, depending if it's a, a right bend or a left bend, you can get the land going down on one side and then all of a sudden that land is going up on the other side. So the, the motion along the fault can change quite dramatically from one place to the other, the vertical motion. So that's another reason why you want to, if you're characterizing a fault zone, you want to take more than a look in one spot. You need to look in many spots along that fault to make sure you're properly characterizing its, its motion, because it does change. I have an interactive question. OK, so you pointed this out as the, the fault. Mm -hmm. But I was also curious. Can you explain these, uh, these guys? Yeah, it's another form of deformation. But because there's no break, it's what I would call folding, where the layers fold, but they don't actually break. Mm. They could be folding from a fault that's actually breaking layers further below where we can't image. Uh, okay. um, or it could just be folding from, from pressure, from pressure yeah. motions. Yeah. yeah okay. Thank you. I'd like to make a personal observation about earthquake insurance, if you don't mind. I figure that in the next 50 years, there's probably about some reasonable probability that my house in Palo Alto could have a million dollars worth of damage. Well, 50 years is a long time from now, but it cost me about $2,000 a year in earthquake insurance. And so in 50 years, I'm only spending $100,000 to save a million dollars worth of damage. And even if it took 100 years, I'd still be cheaper off paying an earthquake. Earthquake insurance. If you don't believe those probabilities, of course, that doesn't count. If this earthquake is really not going to take place for 200 years, I'm wasting my money. But who knows? <laughs> With the research that you have done so far, so we found that the two creeks or the two faults are connected. So are they going to be considered as one fault going forward? Or are they still considered as two separate ones? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think it's worth discussing how they are considered. Yeah. Um, Could we name it the fault? No, we shouldn't rename the fault. 
But yeah, I think what this this work and other work in that are that's looking at these fault intersections and proposed segment boundaries is understanding, okay, how do these faults really connect? And when we're calling them a segment boundary and what that means when you're doing a hazard assessment is what there needs to be a conversation about. Recently, the, the last earthquake rupture model for California, USERF 3, has these segment boundaries in it, but it allows those faults to break together if those if the two faults are spaced a certain distance apart. So based on just a simple, okay, are they five kilometers or less from each other, then they can then they can break. But in the future, perhaps we could use a more sophisticated way of choosing whether or not these faults go together based on earthquake histories or folks that can do dynamic models of how an earthquake rupture behaves in any given fault geometry. There's room for improvement. Yeah. Ah. Well, I think it was. It's the question is why? Um, how is this defined as a segment boundary to begin with? It was it because they mapped it to the Pinole Point and couldn't see it anymore, and and then could map it from the from the north to the south and, and couldn't see it off Sears Point. And the, they project the faults straight from that point and they're separated. And so yeah, they call it a segment boundary. But there are other reasons that it's called a, se it's, it's a segment boundary. And it's because the behavior of the Hayward Fault is quite different from the behavior of the Rogers Creek Fault. Okay, So the Hayward Fault is a creeping fault, it means it's at the surface, it's moving aseismically without, you know, creeping, offsetting curbs and the like. And, some, and that cr fault creep takes up some of the stress in between large earthquakes. It's still, the Hayward Fault still has large earthquakes because the full depth of the fault does not creep. We know that only a sur the surface portion of the fault creeps. The lower portion of the Hayward Fault in a large area is locked. Okay, so from what we know of the Rogers Creek Fault, it is fully locked north of the bay. It may exhibit some creep further to the north near Santa Rosa, um, but there are other reasons to create segment boundaries besides just the geometrical relationship. Yeah. Uh, question about the top gas that you have marked here. It's, it's methane, right? Yes. Um, could you Biogen. take a, or could you speculate on the amount of methane that might be there and whether it's uh, commercially viable and would it be worthwhile <laughs> to, uh, to frack it? I'm afraid not. Yeah. <laughs> but if anyone would like to look into that, they may use these data. <laughs> From my point of view, what you've been look, look, uh, talking about is is rather local in a sense, uh, and the question is, how does that relate to the to the motion of the platelets uh, over each other over uh, time? Uh, is the source of all this the the motion of the platelets, or is it a, a local effect? <laughs> Both. Both. Um, yeah, so the San, the, the San Andreas Fault System is made up of a number of, of, of different faults. And especially in the Bay Area, there are a number of faults that accommodate this motion between the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate. That's where all this is coming from. Okay, and so that motion between the Pacific and North American Plate is, is uh, separated, divided up onto these individual fault strands. And we've got a pretty good idea of how much is proportioned onto each one. But yeah, and then there are definitely local effects. There are fault intersections and one fault will bump into another one and 
impart some motion on it. So it gets more complicated at a local level. But basically, all, all this deformation is because these two plates are sliding past one another. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, two quick questions, uh, or one quick question, maybe a longer one. So the, the vertical scale is one meter. What's the horizontal scale on this graph? That's a great question. Well, the vertical exaggeration is 200 to 1. So oh, okay. I can't do math this late in the day. Okay. But, yeah. It's uh, a, a few, I think it's a, probably a kilometer ish. OK. <laughs> and the second thing uh, related to fr uh, fracking out the methane uh, was at a presentation by another uh, scientist here uh, about a year ago, maybe. And apparently, there is quite a significant signature of uh, some heavy metals, like arsenic and other stuff, contained in the uh, muds from the, um, uh, the mining that went on. And so they basically, basically don't mess with the mud. Just leave it in place. It'll stay there. So if you start disturbing stuff, then that might come out and be a problem. I agree. We're, we're doing it on a very local scale. And actually, those trace elements might provide good markers of dates for offset when we see the arrival of, of mercury or something in the, in the core. So they might actually be helping, helpful to understand the earthquake history. I have a question about um, the more southerly part of the county um, where it, there probably are, is fracking going on now and there certainly is an injection well where they dispose of the huge amounts of um, water that now contaminated that's been used in the fracking process. Um, and there are multiple um, faults in that area. One goes right through the, that area. The San Andreas is about two miles away from uh, where the wells are now. How close or does the injection of water in the ground have to be to the fault to loosen it up and have it move differently? I don't know the answer to your question. <laughs> But it's a good question. Huh? <laughs> it would have to be probably injected very deep <laughs> to affect the fall. I don't know. All right. Looks like it's time to wrap up. So thank you all for coming. And thank you for